Hi, I'm Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master, and on this channel we talk about all things related to TTRPGs, world building, character creation, and running a game. This week, as you might be able to tell, I've had maps on my mind. Now maps are a wonderful tool for any game master to understand the broader scope of what's happening in the world, because unless you're running a very, very interesting game, your players are most likely going to be moving from one location to the next in a relatively linear fashion. This can, of course, make it difficult to prep your world while you're trying to prep a weekly or monthly adventure for your players to get going with. So how do we take the work out of building a world filled with settlements? That's the question of today's video, and I think I've got a pretty good answer. I've been using this method in my games for the past three or four years to try and differentiate between all the different types of settlements that can exist, in my fantasy world at least. Now this is of course based on a kind of medieval-ish fantasy, one with spellcasting and magic to help things along in some cases. Your mileage may vary with using this system in a broader sense, but I have found it very useful indeed in categorising for modern games and modern understandings of cities and towns and other settlements as well. In fact, that's where this concept originated. So, without further ado, let's get into it. When choosing somewhere to visit, I have always wondered about what there is to do there. What makes that place interesting, special, unique? In other words, worth travelling to. Some places are simply more interesting than others. Now this seems harsh. You may live in a small hamlet, a one-horse town, where very little goes on, but you feel in your heart that this is the place that you belong, that is special to you. Well, the people of your fantasy world feel that too. But it is an inescapable fact that when we look for places to travel to, we look for certain things. We and our fantasy medieval-ish compatriots look for travel links, for trade routes, for things to do, things to buy, things to sell, places to visit, sites of war or pilgrimage. All of these have a bearing on how important a place is. But in any world, it is most likely that 80% of the places in it don't have more than one or two of these things. So that's why I've developed this system. I rate every single settlement in my world from one to five. One being it has a single industry or single attraction that people might wish to visit, all the way up to five, which has a multitude of different draws for different types of people. To use a fairly obvious example, a hamlet on a road in between two settlements, a waypoint, if you will, with a single pub and a single street running through it, will get a lot less tourist traffic and trade traffic going specifically to it than the two large cities it lies in between. But this isn't all about size. This is where the ranking system is very important. Now this is Lindisfarne. It is an island off the northeast coast of England with a small village, a castle, and a ruined Benedictine priory from quite some time ago. There is also one single farm. Now judging by the size of the map, the size of the place, it's not a very large island. Lindisfarne could be considered a village, or a very, very small town. In traditional understandings of settlements, this would put it on a scale of one to five at the one or two point. However, 
Lindisfarne is a place of pilgrimage. All across the country and all across the world, people come to visit this Benedictine Priory. It has a castle and is connected to land by an area of ground that is flooded at high tide. It is a truly important historic location, so much so that it is called Holy Island by many people in the UK. Now, under my system, Lindisfarne has multiple significant points of interest. It is a place of pilgrimage, a place of tourism, a place with an interesting geographical feature, a place with a castle, and with a lot of history. And so Lindisfarne, this small town, is able to be associated with some of the grandest cities of the northeast in terms of tourist visits, and even surpasses for some people with specific interests. It is a one-of-a-kind place, and so deserving of a level five. Allow me to describe the distinctions between each stage of my five-step approach. Level one is a settlement with one distinguishing feature or one key industry. This would be your classic lumber outposts, farming villages, fishing villages, wine growing spaces. They may have an interesting building. They may have a place that would draw people. Perhaps the most famous vineyard in your entire fantasy world is located on the outskirts of one of these beautiful tiny hamlets. People come from all over the world to get this wine. But the crucial thing about level one is that you don't really need a map of the place, unless you're some control freak who likes to have a map of everything. The only thing you might need is a map of one interesting location, the interesting location of a level one space. Level two is slightly more complex. It is a place where one or two things are happening. Let's say, a major river crossing mixed with a rather famous manor house where the local count likes to spend his summers. This would constitute a level two area, a space of great interest to very niche communities, i.e. people who want to serve the count in the summer or get the count's attention in the summer or indeed cross a river. But it does not have a nationwide draw. People may travel to it, but they most commonly travel through it. Now, a level three settlement is where we start getting into what one might expect from a mid-sized fantasy town. We have one or two major industries, a market of sorts, and perhaps a unique building or geographic feature. This is the sort of place where locals from a reasonable radius around it will travel to go to town. If farmers are heading to market, this level three settlement is the sort of place where their wares are going to be best appreciated. It often coincides with understandings of a town, but not always. The main characteristic of a level three place is that it is the end point of a journey. Perhaps not an international one, although that may be the case. It is somewhere to be travelled to. A level four settlement is usually larger. It has two or three key industries, is often on a waterway, as many settlements are, and has significant trade opportunities with other places of a similar interest and size. It does not, however, have to be large, sprawling, or anything like that. It is a place that folk might travel across a county to travel to, to visit, to see the sights, or to get a very specialist good that can be found nowhere else, at least in the local vicinity. And level five is the greatest of the great. The sort of place that people would consider traveling across borders for. A grand capital city, perhaps. Or a famous site of pilgrimage. Somewhere with 
a collection of very prestigious schools, or a place of such industry and innovation that people just can't keep away. All of these are justifiably level five spaces. Settlements that define their very region. That are the place that all roads lead to. Your Romes, your Meccas, your Lindisfarnes, and your New Yorks. Now, why would this method be more useful than conceiving of things as hamlet, village, town, large town, city? Well, here's the thing. Firstly, it helps you conceptualise which towns need fleshing out on a map. Here's one of mine. It's a little rough around the edges, but it'll serve as an illustrative example. Each one of these little dots connected by trade roads has been assigned a level. The majority are level one or two. They're places with some niche interest, perhaps an interesting geographical feature, or perhaps a couple of industries working in tandem with each other to make something interesting happen. Or just simply a place where farming is done. Other places, are areas where two or three industries collide to create a slightly more diverse settlement. Or where a great place of interest is inside or very nearby. And just one of these places is level five, a place of technological marvels, the sitting seat of an important count, a city that distributes smelted ore all across this region the place to be, and many of the settlements around it are in service of that goal. Folk will travel all the way along these roads to get to this level five settlement. And that's the important part. Yes, this method helps me as a GM avoid investing all of my effort into places that my players are going to go for, for one specific reason. Yes, if they need lumber, they'll go to this town. Do I need a map of it? Yes, if they want to taste the greatest wine of all the land, they'll go to this level one place. But I really just need a map of the vineyard. But the main benefit of this is that it gives you an intuitive understanding of what the people in your world perceive these settlements as. You may have noticed as I've been talking, all of these levels are based around the movement of people and goods. Will people make pilgrimages to this place? Will people even travel there unless they need a certain good? All of these are really important factors in the lives of the people of your world and having an understanding of their priorities, their concerns, their wants and needs, in a very macro sense, allows you to immediately ascertain any random person's reaction to a different settlement. If giving directions, as an NPC might say, why are you going there? Or they might say, ah, yes, I've always wanted to go there. Or I've been meaning to make the trip. Perhaps I should travel with you. So not only does having this one to five for each of your settlements really help you conceptualize where you need to put in the work, it also has the added benefit of giving you a clear and tangible sense of how the people in your world are going to react. Making the world so much more alive and vibrant. A local farmer may make a single trip to a nearby village to go and pick something up from another farmer. Perhaps a level one space. They may, later that month, travel to a market in, say, a level three gathering space for all the surrounding towns. Maybe that place has a manor, a great market, and is an important ford or river crossing. Level three. And perhaps every year 
there is a religious ceremony that that farmer really wants to go and see in an important place of worship for his gods. He makes the trip of many, many, many miles, joins a caravan of other people heading that way. Well, you know that place has to be a level four or five. Use this method to not only influence your prep, but also influence the attitudes, concerns, and worries of your people in your world. And I guarantee you, you will have a so much more vibrant experience. Your players will be intrigued as to how you could possibly expect that this guy wants to travel with them. Or how you could have possibly planned a caravan between X place and Y place. Persons from ones travel through twos to get to threes. They spend some time in threes. Every so often they make a more important trip to a four or a five using twos and threes as stopping off points along the route. This is how people are, especially how people were. That's how people got around before the proliferation of maps. You would know the road you needed to take to the next town, and they in the next town would know where the next route is to get to your final destination eventually. It's a network, a spider web of people going to places. And if you can mimic that with such a simple system as this, it makes your world live. I hope you find this method interesting and can start to conceptualize some of your settlements in this way. I find it really helps to just boil down the essence of exactly what I want out of a place for my games. If you do use it, let me know. But for now, I just wanted to share that little tip on how to make your world feel dynamic. And while doing so, decrease your prep for a game. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. If you can do all the YouTube things, that would be amazing. Share this video with a friend or several. And as usual, if you have any questions, anything you'd like to see me talk about in future, please let me know. So all that remains to say, I've been the Grunge Master. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.